Hey, good morning, Grace. Hi, everybody. Good to see you all today. Thank you for being here, and thanks to everybody who's watching and joining us online from the Houston area. And then also there are people from around the country who are dialed in to uh, this service. And then we have our international uh, leaders from all over the world who are a part with us here this Sunday. I'm just going to ask you to put your hands together and welcome everybody who's joining us right now online. So uh, before I jump into this message today, I just want to say a couple of things. Uh, we don't always get to tell you everything that's happening at the church, but there's, a couple, there's two things that I really think are great, and then one thing I want to point you to. Uh, many of you have seen, and it's been a couple weeks, so it's kind of uh, fallen out of our consciousness a little bit, but Florida got hit really badly with a hurricane. And we know what that's like here, especially here at Grace. We know what it's like to go through that. And I just want you to know, because of your generosity, uh, we were able to send finances to churches that are in those communities. It's so important because as the church is healthy and able to reach the community, it makes a huge difference in rebuilding the community. So just so you know, part of your generosity is helping spread the gospel and help people have homes to live in in Florida. So thank you for your generosity, everybody. Thank you for that. And then uh, this week, we got an honor to, um, to host several hundred pastors here for a pastor's event uh, here at Grace. One of the things that's part of our heart is to help pastors uh, just uh, do their very best in ministry, and it's part of who we are to support and applaud and lift up pastors. Look, you don't have to be from this church. We are all part of Jesus' church, and we're all working together. That's our heart. So we're part of his church in the Houston area, and we got a chance to serve other pastors. It was really great. Many of you came out, volunteered your time, and so I just want to tell you thank you for giving of your time to help and serve the church uh, of Houston. Then just for my part, I just want to point to the women's conference and say, ladies, make sure you get signed up today. Uh, the title of the conference is Together Believe For It. And so it's a great place to make friends and great place to experience God and a great place to believe for God's best for you. All right, let's jump into the series today. This is called Jesus Said Forgive. This is part three of this series. And what we're looking at is the places in the Bible where Jesus talked about forgiveness. Now, he talked about it a lot, and we don't have time in the series to unpack every single spot that it appears. But what we want to do is get an idea, get a feel for what Jesus has to say about forgiveness. I'm going to tell you why this is really important. A recent survey was done of Christians, people who go to church like you and me, and they asked, what's something you really want to hear more about from the Bible? Top of the list was forgiveness. In other words, we need to know that God has forgiven us, and we need to, to work through how to forgive others. Many people are dealing with issues in our lives, and something's happened, and it wasn't fair, it wasn't right, something happened to you. Maybe you have the challenge of trying to let go of that and move on. It's not as easy as it may seem. Well, Jesus understood that. And so he talked about the power of forgiveness, and we're just going to jump in and unpack it uh, together today. In the part one, I talked about what is forgiveness. I just defined it there. Part two was last week, and I talked about the life-changing qualities of God's forgiveness. How can you and I experience the forgiveness of God? Because we need that in our life. And by the way, if you're ever going to be a person who can forgive others, you have to be forgiven yourself. And so it's so important if you are struggling in your own life with letting go of your past or decisions that you've made, I really encourage you to go back and pick up that message from last week because I know it will help you to know what it means to be forgiven by God. And that's what gives you the fuel to then forgive others, which is what I'm gonna talk about today. Today's part, uh, is part three of the series, and the title of the message is Forgiving Freely. Forgiving Freely. And literally, I wanna teach you what the Bible has to say about how you and I can forgive someone else. So maybe at the start of this series, you thought, man, I really want to hear this series because I've got some stuff to forgive some people about. And when's he going to get to the place where he tells us what to actually do? Okay, I get it. I'm supposed to forgive. How do I do it? I'm going to answer that question from the Bible with you today. Forgiving freely, forgiving freely. I want to look at this scripture, Luke 17. Put this in your notes, Luke 17, starting in verse one. Here's what it says. Then he, and that's Jesus, said to the disciples... It's impossible that no, offense, that, offenses, that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, you rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Now I wanna take just a moment and unpack a few places in this scripture with you 
and to kind of set up what we're talking about today. And here's what I want you to see. First off, look at the first verse that I highlighted here. It's impossible that no offenses should come. Stop right here and realize this. One of the greatest things about the Bible is that it is a very realistic book. What am I saying? I'm saying this. The Bible understands what it's like to live real life here on earth. And here Jesus even says, listen, I'm just here to tell you, the world is not perfect. If you are expecting the world to be fair, you need to know you're gonna be disappointed. It is impossible that no offenses should come. In other words, some things are gonna hurt you in this life. The only people who don't get hurt in life are people who never live life. If you're gonna have relationships with people, you're gonna be hurt at times, you're gonna be disappointed at times. Some things are gonna happen that you were not expecting. And Jesus is clearly just acknowledging that. It's impossible that offenses should not come. You're gonna have a reason to be offended. Listen, if you want to be offended, there's a lot of reasons, Jesus said. And if we're gonna live our life every day for him, we have to realize that there are things that are gonna happen to us that really we wish they hadn't happened. We're gonna deal with and wrestle with those things. I'm saying that to say this to you. If you're dealing with some issues in your life, you're not alone. All of us have some of these things going on, and they come in different shapes and sizes. So I I made a list. For example, you may need to forgive what I call some mini offenses, mini, extra small. It's like when somebody cuts you off on the freeway. That's a mini offense. Some of you got offended on the way to church. Somebody, hey, somebody parks in your favorite parking spot in the parking lot. I'm just here to tell you that's actually a mini offense. That's small, everybody. Or, uh, for example, uh, just tell me if this ever happened to you. The people in front of you at Starbucks get to the front and do not know their order after waiting in line for 10 minutes. (laughs) It's still a mini offense, just want to say. I did a little survey, some of our staff. Here's one that I got back. Here's a mini offense. When you have to change your baby's diaper two times in a row, that's a mini offense. Okay. Or your spouse left trash in your car. That's many, small. Small, small. But it gets bigger, right? So I, there's many offenses. Then I, I, these are minor offenses. So it goes from many to minor. So that may be if somebody insults you, that's maybe a minor offense. Or somebody forgets your birthday and they should have remembered your anniversary, a special day. If somebody does something, it's accidental. They didn't mean to do it, but it just didn't feel right. Somebody makes a sarcastic comment that hurt you. It's a minor offense. But then after minor offenses, there's major offenses. You see how this is growing. And you might be dealing with some of those in your life. For example, somebody posts something about you on social media. Or a friend gossips to you, to the rest of your friends, about some things that aren't true. Or you experience prejudice in life in some situation. Maybe a major offense is somebody who lies about you or your reputation to others. Or you're in business and somebody breaks a business contract or blows up a deal that was really important to your business. You could carry a major offense for that. So there's many, there's minor, there's major, and then there's massive. I know that not everybody, but there are some people here in the room today. I know not everybody, but there are some people who are watching today who aren't dealing with many offenses and they're not even dealing with minor or major offenses, they're dealing with massive offenses. What do I mean by massive offense? I mean something that happened in your life that should not happen to anyone, anywhere, anytime, in any circumstance, in any situation. I'm talking about the the things in life that feel like a bomb went off and I'll never recover because of what somebody did to me. I'm talking about things that are hard to talk about. I'm talking about a spouse cheating on you. I'm talking about abuse, whether it's physical, emotional, even sexual abuse, massive offenses. I'm talking about walking through a divorce or your family falling apart. I'm talking about things that feel like you may never recover. And here's what I'm here to say today. I don't know your story. I don't know all the details of what you have walked through. But I wanna say this. If you're here today and you're dealing with a massive offense, If you're here today and you have some weight that's on your shoulders that's so big, you maybe even don't feel like you can talk about it. If you're here today and you've suffered something so deep and so terrible that you just feel like you'll never be the same, I just want you to know this. 
you're in the right place today. You know why? Because the presence of Jesus is in this place. And when you face something that's impossible, and when you face something that is so painful, and when you face something that has hurt you so badly, I wanna tell you that Jesus is still a miracle worker, and he can work a miracle in your heart and in your life, and he can make a change that nobody else can make for you, so I'm glad you're here. And I wanna say one more thing. You don't have to fix it on your own. You don't have to clean up, you don't have to get right, you don't have to fix your life. The truth is, When we need God the most, we deserve him the least. And you may be sitting here saying to yourself, well, man, after all I went through, I don't even think God wants me. I'm here to tell you, God absolutely wants you. It's why you're here. It's why you're listening to this message right now. It's why you're tuned in right now because Jesus wants you to know that he loves you right where you are right now. And he has the power to change your life if you'll let him in. It's impossible that no offenses should come. Things are going to happen in this life. And I don't know what anybody told you when you came to faith in Jesus, but if somebody said, if you're gonna be a Christian, you won't have any trouble, I'm here to tell you they didn't quote the Bible. I'm here to tell you that serving God, you might actually have some more trouble in this life. You may at some point be persecuted for your faith because you believe in Jesus. So you have some, the rain falls on the righteous and unrighteous the same. You're gonna have some problems in life, but here's what I know, is that you may have the same problems as everybody else, but it won't be the same as everybody else because you have Jesus to walk with you through every moment and every step of every challenge in your life. So he said, it's impossible that offenses shouldn't come. And then he goes on to describe it. He says, look, if somebody sins against you, somebody does something against you, somebody does something wrong, that you need to forgive them seven times in a day. Underline that in your Bible, here's why. I wanna take you there and I want you to put on the hat of being one of these disciples because every one of these disciples was thinking the same thing in this moment. And here is what they thought. They had been taught from the time they were children, from the time they were small, in rabbinic Jewish tradition, here's what they were taught. You forgive somebody three times. You can forgive somebody three times. Time number four, you do not forgive anymore. So everybody gets forgiven three times. So if somebody makes a mistake, you forgive them, make it again, you forgive them, make it again, you forgive them, but on time number four, you clobber them. From the time they were small. And here comes Jesus, and here's what he says. Now watch this. He says, if they do wrong to you seven times in the same day, I'm still calling you to forgive them. Wow. This is mind-blowing because Jesus always takes the law that they were taught and expands it to include not just our behavior but our heart. Do you see here that what he's teaching is that you have to have a forgiving heart? You need to have the kind of heart that's willing to forgive. And that's why the, this makes the whole last statement make sense. Jesus says, I know you were taught that you only forgive three times and then you can clobber them. And you can read the scripture and go, well, Jesus said you forgive them seven times and on number eight, you can beat them up. No, he doesn't say that. Jesus says our forgiveness needs to be something that comes out of our heart. And this is why the disciples then say, Lord, if that's true, if you want us to live that way, you are gonna have to increase our faith. By the way, it's the only time they ask for increased faith. Healings, didn't ask for increased faith. Miracles, didn't ask for increased faith. But when it comes to living my life as a free person, forgiving others, oh God, you are going to have to help me have more faith to trust you in the process. And if you feel like you can't forgive, I'm just here to tell you, let's pray that this series will help increase your faith to believe God so that you can walk out everything that he's teaching us to live out. So Jesus said, forgive. So I'm gonna take the rest of this message, I'm gonna talk to you about two things. One is what does the Bible really say about forgiveness? And two, what are the steps? I'm gonna teach you four steps to forgiveness. But before that, I wanna go to our mindset just for a moment. And I wanna show you four fallacies that our culture teaches us about forgiveness. Now, I'm not saying that somebody sat you down and taught this to you, but I am saying it's so prevalent in our culture that we've just absorbed it somehow and grabbed hold of it somehow and we need to face this and understand it before we move on. Here's number one. Culture teaches that forgiving is optional. 
Our culture teaches us that you can forgive or not forgive, it's up to you. In fact, in some places our culture celebrates that you don't forgive, it's optional. It's not something that you have to do, it's something that you do if you choose to do. But what does the Bible say? Write the scripture down, Matthew 6, 14 and 15. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. What's Jesus teaching us here? That there is a connection between me forgiving others and receiving forgiveness in my own life. Now, let me stop for a minute, just take a quick aside, and I did this in the first message. This is not talking about your salvation. It's not teaching us that the only way to get saved is to forgive someone else, because if we had to do that, then we would work for our salvation, but the Bible teaches us salvation is a gift from God. There isn't anything, listen to me, there isn't anything that you can do to deserve or earn salvation. Salvation is because of Jesus' death on the cross, period, end of sentence. It's not something that we earn or do. But what Jesus does show us is this, that forgiveness is not optional. Forgiveness is connected to you living in freedom, and you'll never live the free life he wants for you if you don't forgive. That's why the Bible teaches that forgiveness is a requirement for Christians. It's required so that you can live free and live out the life that God created you to live. Here's the second fallacy. Culture teaches that forgiving is about the person deserving it. Some people deserve to be forgiven and other people don't deserve to be forgiven. And what we need to do is decide who deserves it and who doesn't deserve it. And yet, look at what the Bible says. This scripture out of Colossians 3.13, bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. And then look at this, forgive as the Lord forgave you. I highlighted that because I wanna dig deeper into it with you. See, if you have been tempted to say, well, I would forgive them, but they really don't deserve it. I wanna point you to the scripture because the Bible teaches us to forgive as the Lord forgave you. And let me ask you this question. Did you, forgive, did you deserve it when Jesus forgave you? None of us did. So what is he saying here? We need to forgive in the same way that God forgave us. In other words, the culture teaches that it's about the person deserving it, but the Bible teaches that forgiveness is freely received and freely given. Everyone in this room and everybody watching online ought to be grateful that we are forgiven by God, it is a free gift, and we just receive it freely from him. It isn't something we earn, it isn't something we deserve, it's something he gives. The Bible teaches us that as you have received, so shall you give. All right, here's the third fallacy. Culture teaches that forgiving means minimizing the offense or the pain. In other words, that forgiveness is about make it, just make it smaller, just act like it didn't happen, just ignore it, just push it down, just stick it somewhere where you don't see it. Minimize that. But that's not true. See, the Bible teaches us otherwise. Hebrews 9, 22 says this, that in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Here's what it's teaching you and me. When there's a sin, when somebody sins against you, there is a debt, and that that debt has to be paid. And all through the Old Testament, the only way that debt was paid was with a sacrifice. And that pointed to the greatest sacrifice, which was Jesus. But it does not teach us to make small of it. In fact, you have to actually face the issue that happened to be able to properly forgive and let go. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. Forgiveness is a voluntary form of suffering. And so the culture teaches you and me that forgiving means to minimize the offense or the pain, but the Bible teaches that forgiveness is recognizing the debt and rejecting our right to be repaid. Here's number four. Culture teaches forgiving happens on its own. For example, if I ask for a show of hands, how many of you, somebody's ever said to you, well, time heals all wounds. All of us have heard that, and the reason you're chuckling is you know it's not true. I'm gonna tell you what, time can actually make the wound worse. Time doesn't heal all wounds. That's just not true. But God can heal any wound in your life. Acts 3.19 says this, repent then and turn to God that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. In other words, if you'll walk in forgiveness, God has a refreshing that can happen in your life that you don't get any other way. Here's a quote that's worth writing down. To forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. How many people 
live in the cage of unforgiveness in their life. To forgive is to set the prisoner free, only to find out the prisoner is you. So culture teaches that for time heals all wounds, but the Bible teaches this, that really forgiveness is the pathway to healing. Time won't heal you, but forgiveness will. So if we believe that, if we say, you know what, we're gonna reject the way the culture teaches us to live our lives. In fact, if you just look at how the culture operates, they're not getting good results anyway. Can I just tell you, might as well try it God's way. It can't get a whole lot worse if you follow our culture today. So let's see what the Bible really says. What do I do if I'm gonna be a forgiving person? How do I actually make that work in my life? So I wanna teach you right now how to forgive freely. Remember, that's the title of the message, Forgive Freely, and I'm gonna teach that to you this way. And this is to help you remember, it's a little trick, like a communication trick. I'm gonna give you four give statements. So like, get it, forgive freely, forgive statements. You follow what I'm saying? Forgive, 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 forgive. How many think that's cheesy? Raise your hand. Okay, but you'll remember it. So I'm gonna take you to the greatest example, and that's Jesus. I wanna look at his life, And I'm gonna show you four give statements that tell us how to forgive someone. Okay, let's walk through this. Jesus was going to the cross. This is where we pick up his life, and we're just gonna drop on a few scriptures along the way to see how did he actually do it and to put that in practice for you and me. So Jesus was going to the cross. He was about to uh, give the most significant forgiveness. It was a huge weight, a huge burden. Let's look at how he did it. Number one, write this in your notes. Give up control to God. Give up. So the first give statement is to give up. Give up control to God. That's what Jesus did. He was facing the worst day of his life and he spent time with the Father and he gave up control of his future to God. Luke 22, 41 through 43. He withdrew, that's Jesus, about a stone's throw beyond them. He knelt down and he prayed. Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. This is the moment that Jesus gave up control to God. After this moment, he'll be arrested. After this moment, he'll be beaten. After this moment, he'll go to the cross. After this moment, he'll give his life. After this moment, there's a lot of suffering. And in this moment, as he's facing it, he realizes and understands the only way that this will work is if I give up control to God. Not my will, but yours be done. If I had it my way, I'd do this differently. But God, I submit myself, I surrender myself to your will. I give up control to God. I would submit to you that the first place, the place you need to start if you're dealing with forgiveness in your life is to give up control to God. Because here's what I know. At any point, in any place in our lives where we face a forgiveness issue, it does become about control. You see, if you hurt me, I wanna control things so you can't hurt me anymore. If you say something about me, I wanna control things so you can't say that about me anymore. If you offend me, I wanna control the situation so that you can't do that to me anymore. It comes out of a self-preservation, but here's what I see. In Jesus' life, many times the beginning, the starting place for us is to give up control to God. So how do we apply this? Well, look, I just challenge all of us that we need to give up control in every area to God. That's what it means to make Jesus your Lord. And so I love his example here. He says, not my will, but yours be done. Have you ever prayed that prayer? God, not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. You may feel like you need to pray that every single day because there are times in our lives where our will and God's will cross. In other words, here's what I'm here to tell you. There's times where God's will is not the same as your will. And it's in those moments in that intersection where they cross that you have to take up your cross and follow him. Don't get revenge. Don't say something nasty back. Don't don't follow through with that bad thought that you had. All of us are gonna have some of those thoughts, but you gotta let it go in and pass through. Don't hold on to it and don't act on it. Let it go. Give up control to God. If you haven't given up control to God, that's where it starts. Give up control to God. Here's number two, give out. So first is give up, second is give out. Give out unconditional forgiveness. Jesus then, after that garden moment where he prays, he goes to the cross, and on the cross he has something so significant to say there. Jesus, after being beaten and crucified, he forgave those that hurt him 
even though they never acknowledged they were wrong. Can I go deeper with you? Luke 23, verse 34. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. You can forgive somebody without having to tell them what they did was wrong. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Jesus gave out unconditional forgiveness. He could have said, Father, forgive them if they ever turn around and admit that what they did was wrong, but that's not what he said. He said this, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. Hebrews 2, 17 and 18 talks about Jesus' life and says this. That's why he had to enter into every detail of human life. Stop there and know this. Whatever you're dealing with, whether it's a mini offense, a minor offense, a major offense, even a massive offense, you need to know that Jesus understands your situation. You may feel like nobody in the world can understand what I've been through, and that may be true. You may not feel like you can share it with anybody, but I'm here to tell you that Jesus has experienced the pain of what you're going through. That's why the Bible says that he entered into every detail of human life. He knows what it's like to be abandoned. He knows what it's like to have people he loves turn their back on him. He knows what it's like to be alone. He knows what it's like to suffer. He knows what it's like to, to have something happen to him that's unfair. He understands you. And one of the greatest weapons of the enemy is to cause you to feel misunderstood in your pain. And I'm just here to tell you that wherever you are, if you're sitting here today and maybe you just feel like you're all alone, I want you to know that Jesus comes over and sits in the seat next to you and he knows exactly where you are and he knows exactly where you've been and he knows exactly how it feels and he's here to help you so that you don't have to stay there. How many are grateful for a savior who took on everything that we would face so that he could be our high priest the Bible says that's why he became the high priest to get rid of people's sins. He would have already experienced them all himself, all the pain, all the testing, and would be able to help where he was needed. So forgiveness does not require the other person to admit it. It doesn't require the other person to ask for it. It does not require the other person to repent. It does not require the other person to deserve it. You can forgive someone Say, man, how, how do I forgive them? I'm never gonna see them again. Forgiveness is a choice that you make. So give out unconditional forgiveness. Because literally what you're doing when you forgive in this way is you are transferring a debt. Now many of us kind of know what that's like because we have a debt and we move it maybe from one credit card to another credit card. You ever transfer your credit card balance and you move it from one credit card to another credit card? Well, it's the same idea, but here's how it works. When somebody does something wrong to you, there's a debt there and you literally take that debt and instead of transferring it onto your other card, you transfer it onto God's card and he takes over the weight of that debt. You're literally giving it over to him. So you give out unconditional forgiveness. Why? Because you gave the debt over to God. And I'm here to tell you that God is just and he is holy and God will work it out even if you don't see it. So you can give unconditional forgiveness along the way. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I've given a debt over to God, I wanted to give it over to the Old Testament God. You know what I'm talking about? I want some, I want that open up the ground and swallow people, God. I want that... Come on now. I want you to ca cause the water to go in on them and kill them. But the real test of my trust is that I'll give it over to God and I'll let it go. I'll let it go. And then I can give out unconditional forgiveness. Here's number three. So give up control to God. Give out unconditional forgiveness. Number three, give away good for evil. Give away good for evil. Luke 23, verse 43. Jesus is on the cross, and when he could have called down judgment on that moment, he chose to still do good for others, even while he was on the cross dying. Luke 23, 43 says this, Jesus answered him, this is to the thief and the cross right next to him, truly I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. In the moment when Jesus could have looked at the pain he was in and the suffering that was happening and just turned away from everybody, here's what he chose to do. In that moment, he still reached out to make a difference in someone's life. Give away good for evil. Evil was being done to him, but he was giving away good. Romans 12, 17 through 21. Here's what the Bible says. Now, we've got to learn this. Here's what it says. Repay no one evil for evil. Stop right there. Don't cut them off on the freeway because they cut you off on the freeway. Come on. 
vengeful, cut her off her person? <laughs> don't, hey, don't speak bad about them just because they spoke bad about you. You say, well, somebody needs to know I'm just a truth teller. That's not a spiritual gift. Don't hurt them because they hurt you. I'm not saying it's easy, I'm just saying it's right. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what's honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Literally, you can come to the place in walking in forgiveness where you can do something nice for someone who did something mean to you. That's not a sign of weakness, everybody. That's actually a sign of strength. Give away good for evil. Now, let me just teach you something really quick. You write these two words down, I wanna talk about them. One is forgiveness and the other is reconciliation. I I wanna explain this because many times we get those two confused. So forgiveness is letting go of what happened. Reconciliation is healing in the relationship to the person that did it. They're not the same thing. Now you can't have reconciliation without forgiveness, but you may have forgiveness and still not be able to have reconciliation. Here's why. Forgiveness is you letting go. Reconciliation is healing in the relationship. Forgiveness is between you and God. Reconciliation is between you and the offender. Forgiveness requires one. You can choose to forgive right now, but reconciliation requires two. The other person has to be willing. You say, well, I mean, they did wrong to me. I forgave them, but our relationship still isn't the same. It might be that way because you don't have control of the other person. You can't make somebody reconcile with you. You can only be open to reconciling yourself. And that's why, back it up one slide, you guys. That's why the Bible says this as far as it depends on you. In other words, you might forgive someone of something bad that they did to you and you still don't have, they're still not your best friend. That relationship may be broken and gone, not because you weren't willing to reconcile, but maybe they weren't willing to reconcile and those things happen. Don't confuse reconciliation with forgiveness. You don't have to reconcile with the person to forgive what they did to you. You can forgive and let it go even if there's no reconciliation. And that's important for people who've been wronged by somebody who's, for, for example, somebody who's already dead, who's already gone on to be with the Lord or the other way. And you say, man, how do I fix that? How do I forgive them? You can forgive them, but you, you may not ever be able to reconcile with them. And that can happen in relationships here too. Give away good for evil. So give up control to God, give out unconditional forgiveness, give away good for evil. Here's the last one, four. The fourth give statement, give over to God to redeem. So give up, give out, give away, and then give over to God to redeem. Jesus trusted God that his sacrifice of obedience would be turned into something powerful for the kingdom of God, even if he did not see how or when. But the Bible says in Luke 24, 46 to 48, this is what's written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sin will be preached in his name to all the nations. Let me unpack that for you just a minute. Imagine Jesus is on the cross. He's been beaten. He's been accused. He's been bloodied. He's had to carry the cross beam. They've crucified him, driven nails between his wrists. They raised the cross, and every breath he takes is a painful breath. Ultimately, he's going to give his life away on that cross. He can't see what's gonna happen with all of that. He doesn't understand all that, but what he does is trust God that if he's obedient to what God said, God will use it. And here's what the Bible says, that that one act in that one moment of Jesus giving his life on the cross is what opened the door for people to come to God, not just in that moment, but in every moment in history. The fact of the matter is, the only reason you and I can have a relationship with God is because what Jesus did in that one moment on the cross. He is the only way to get to God. Jesus is the one and only Son of God. He's the one and only way to God. And what he did on the cross made the way for us. Thank God that he trusted God. And he gave it over to God for the results. And here's what I'm here to tell you. That you've been hurt, you've been wrong. Something bad's happened in your life. 
You can fill in the blank with what that is. But here's what I know. Whatever it is, if you're willing to walk in forgiveness, God can redeem it. In other words, God can take the pain that happened to you and he can use it to make a difference for someone else. Maybe you know the pain of what it's like to be left and all alone. God can make you sensitive to somebody else who's lonely that needs to know him. Maybe you know the pain of a relationship that's broken and fallen apart. God could use you to speak to somebody who's walking right where you walked. Maybe you understand what it's like to be in a really difficult spot. Maybe you know what it's like to be betrayed or even to be abused. And I'm not here to tell you that God wanted those things to happen to you. I don't believe that he did, not for one minute, because God is a good God. But I do believe that other people make choices. And sometimes those choices are painful. You may be the victim of somebody else's bad choices. And I'm not here to tell you that God wanted it to happen. I don't believe that God wanted that to happen to anybody. But here's what I know. If you'll take the situation in your life and you'll give it to him, God can redeem it. The scars of Jesus are what made a way for our salvation. And the scars in your life that you carry of the pain that you've been through, God can use to touch somebody else who's hurting if you will give it over to him to redeem. Listen, let God be the judge. In the end, he's the perfect judge. And if you keep holding it and carrying it in your own life, it's gonna wreck you from the inside out. God can redeem what we cannot. So trust God to work it out in his plan and his sovereignty. And when you give it over to God's hands, don't take it back into your own. I wanna close today with a quote uh, from Mother Teresa. I'm just gonna read this to you and then in a moment I'm gonna pray for you. Here's what it says. People are often unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you're kind, people may accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you're honest and frank, people may cheat you. Be honest and frank anyway. What you spend years building, someone could destroy overnight. Build anyway. The good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world your best, and it may never be enough. Give the world your best anyway. You see, she said, in the final analysis, it is between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. And when it comes to forgiving freely, everybody, it is between you and God now. It's between you and God. So forgive freely. Give up control to God. Give out unconditional forgiveness. Give away good for evil. And give it over to God to redeem. I wanna pray for you. Will you bow your heads, please? As I close this message, there's two ways I wanna pray. The first one is, for anybody who's here or watching online that needs to open your heart to the love of God. I talked about Jesus being the one and only son of God and the one and only way to God. He's the only way you can have a real relationship with the God who created you. He made the sacrifice of giving his life upon the cross for you. And it's personal. And so I'd like to ask you today, have you ever opened your heart to the love of God? Because if you haven't, now is the time. You say, man, you don't understand. I'm hurting, I have pain, I've got problems, I've got issues. If you knew the issues I had, you would think that God doesn't want me. Absolutely, God wants you. You're the reason why he went to the cross. It's so that you could know in this moment right now that God loves you and that Jesus died for you. Will you open your heart and let him in? I'm gonna pray a prayer to help you do just that. Nobody in this place or watching online needs to be scared of this prayer. I'm gonna lead you and guide you. I'm here to help. I'll help you express your heart to God. But before we do, I'm gonna ask you to respond by lifting your hand in just a moment. I'm gonna count to three. And I'm gonna ask for people all over this room and watching online to lift your hand and hold it up, to lift it up high and hold it up. And then I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. So right there, while people's heads are bowed all around this place, if you're here today and you need to say yes to Jesus, there's sin in your life, there's junk in your life, you know you need Jesus at the center of your life. Maybe you knew him a long time ago, but you've wandered away, you've gone your own way. It's time for you 
to come back and put Jesus in the center. If that's where you are today, right now, I want to pray with you. And so my hand's up and I'm gonna ask you to lift yours in just a minute. I'm gonna count to three. One, for everybody who's here that needs to open their heart to the love of Jesus. Two, I want you to make that decision. You're just gonna slip your hand up and hold it up high. I'm gonna have you put it down and we're gonna pray. One, two, three. All around this room, lift your hand and hold it up. All over this room, there are people lifting their hands to the Lord today and online too. Right there in your living room, you can sit there and lift your hand too. God sees all that, it really is for him. And now you can put your hands down. I see those hands all over the place here. You can put your hands down and let me lead you in a prayer. I'm gonna ask everybody in the room today to pray this prayer out loud together. It helps build people's faith and it makes it easier on those who are praying for the very first time. So I want everybody to pray together. Even if uh, this isn't your first time to pray this prayer, please pray with me out loud. I'm gonna lead you phrase by phrase and we're gonna pray together. Let's pray. Pray this way. Dear Jesus, I come to you and I believe in you. I believe you're the son of God. I believe that you died on the cross and I believe you rose again. I open my heart to you now and I invite you into my life. Now heal me, change me, forgive me and make me new. Thank you for what you've done for me. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, come on, everybody. Put your hands together for people who prayed that prayer online in the room today. We exist as a church to help lead people in a growing relationship with Jesus. We wanna do that for you. That's why we're here. Before we go today, uh, I saved another prayer for you. And I'm gonna ask everybody in the room to stand to your feet. Would you do that? The worship team's coming back and we're gonna sing one more worship song. Our prayer team's gonna come to the front And today, if you have a need of any kind, whether it's your family or your kids or a need in your marriage or a a need for God's wisdom in a situation, we want to pray for you. We do this every single week. Every week, we worship God. Every week, we look at God's word. Every week, we pray for miracles. We wanna pray for you. But this message may have stirred something in you. And you might say, man, I just need help. I just want somebody to reach to me and believe with me. There's a team of people standing right here in the front that want to reach to you and believe with you. If you're online today, you can just type into the chat. We'll pray with you there. If you're in the room today, I want you to slip out of your seat and start walking this way. You won't be the only one. There'll be people coming from every section who want prayer today, and you can join them. If you're here, you're brand new. It's your first time here. We want to pray for you. If you have a need, we believe that God cares about your life, and he wants to do something for you. And so step out of your seat and come this way. Everybody else, let's sing with the team. We're going to worship God one more time and lift him up, and then we'll close this service together. But let's worship the Lord one more time. If you have a need of any kind or the message stirred you for prayer, step out, come this way, come to one of these folks, and let us pray with you. Everybody else, let's worship the Lord together.